Hey everyone, Fide Master Dennis Montecrucis here, and it's time for another Reviewer Games and Questions show. So we're going to combine them this time around, and uh, let's begin. So this first one is submitted by Prospero, who asks um, for some advice about how to play this position with white. So he comments that it seems to him that the pawn structure should favor white, since his pieces are more active than blacks, and the d5 pawn is preventing black from mobilizing his majority. But he found himself completely unable to come up with a plan for white. And he adds that it seems like the usual minority attack ideas are not quite applicable here. Well, right. I mean, that's certainly, I think everything that, that you said is just about right there. I mean, so white is better. And the main reason, of course, is the, the pressure on the C file against the pawn on C7. I mean, this, thanks to the D5 pawn, um, this is all correct. And, yeah, I mean, it's not really a, certainly it's not a t typical minority attack plan, I mean, or position. I mean, there you would have to have pawns on let's say black pawns on c6 and d5, and you go for b4, b5. But to say that, um, there are some similarities. So one idea could be to push your pawn to b5. Let's say we'll, we'll assume that black is offering no opposition here to this plan. Okay, so uh, b4, a4, b5, takes and takes. All right, well, once that happens, you're threatening b6, or you can triple up on the c file first, of course, and then you're threatening b6. Uh, if he plays b6, well then you'll bring a rook to c6. Again, you'll be tripled. Let's say you, you set up the, the Eliakin's gun or Alakine's gun. And um, and then there's threats of rook takes b6. So such an idea is, in fact, entirely possible. All right, so that, that would be one kind of strategy to, to, to try to um, safely get a pawn to b5 and go for b6. Um, in general, I mean, this is where your bread is going to be buttered. I mean, you want to put as much pressure against that pawn on c7 as you can. But at a certain point, most likely, you're going to need to create some second weakness. So remember that famous principle, the principle of two weaknesses. If all we've got is c7, black can probably hold, although it's 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 a pretty pretty weak point. I mean, he might not be able to, but generally speaking, if your opponent only has to cover one thing, then you need to create some second weakness somewhere else. So... Um, some sort of pushing on the queen side might be possible. For instance, another idea might be to play um, a4, a5, and, and then play for b4, b5, but to do so in a way where you're recapturing with, with a pawn, uh, sorry, with, with a piece. Um, so let's suppose you end up with the queens off the board, pawn on a5, rook on b5. Well, here you can see you could transfer all the pressure now to the b7 pawn, and he can't defend it as easily. Uh, if he plays, you know, he can put a rook on b8, but how does he defend it the second time? If he plays c6, then d takes c6, exploits the pin on the b file. So that might be a way to go as well. Um, additionally, in some cases, you might play something like h4 and um, play h5. All right, if he, um, if he takes on h5, of course, then he's really weakening himself. If he doesn't, then you might take on g6. I guess I should put some arrows in here h4, h5, okay, and then there's options with either h6, and maybe play queen d4, and look at the g7 square, or another idea might be to play h, g6, swing a rook to the h file, and play queen d4. So there are various ways in which you could try to uh, to kind of ramp up the pressure here. So we'll look at a couple of little, just, just very short lines, uh, and these are, don't even really fully explore what we just talked about either, so there are a lot of ways to a lot of ways we can proceed. Okay, one idea, a4. Uh, preparing either a5 or to play with preparation b4, b5. All right, let's say black plays a5 to meet this. Well, now we can play queen d4. And we're centralizing. We may, um, may also just jump in to a7. So this is uh, an annoying threat because if he plays b6, well, then c7, I mean, it's just really under fire. And there might be ideas like b4 and a5 at some point. Anyway, th this is a way to improve the position. Now, against all of these plans, black might try to counterattack against the d5 pawn with queen f5. So if queen a7, queen takes d5. Um, so here, rook c4, h5, queen d2, hitting a5, b6, queen d4 again. Notice there's no real re need to hurry. We can just induce further weaknesses and then, at our leisure, look for a way to break in. King h7, rook c6. So now... Uh, there are at least, in the air, ideas like rook takes d6 and rook takes b6. They don't work yet because the queen on f5 guards the rook, but this stuff is at least on the docket. We could prepare it, for instance, with rook c4 and then queen to c3. The only problem is this guy is hanging, so white may 
choose to uh, to find some way of dealing with that threat first. Uh, also, of course, you could just play queen to c4, but still, after it takes, 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 again, that pawn is loose. All right, rook e5. So this makes uh, makes the idea even clearer. Well, queen c4, and here we don't mind making the trade because after rook d5, rook c7, black's queen side will be just uh, horribly weak. So king g7 looks like a good waiting move. Okay, queen c3, little pin, king g8, and now f3. So this is uh, something that white may be forced to do at some point, play for f3 and e4 to uh, neutralize the pressure on the, e4, uh, the d5 pawn. So queen d7, e4, f5, and this is what we can expect in turn. e takes f5, rook f5, and now we can switch gears here. Again, if rook b6, then um, rook takes d5. So queen d3 protects that pawn, and all right, little maneuvering about here, but this is the idea. So now white gets a new trump. Now there's an open e file, and the rook's going to come to e6, the queen goes to e4, and okay, let's do a little space gaining here, and you can see that black is uh, very vulnerable. So he's always got to watch out for the c7 pawn from direct attacks, taking on b6 or d6 in cases where there's a, a black rook on c8. And now the e-file is, is in play as well. So this would be an example. Another example, instead of a4, let's say rook c4, h5, a4, rook e5, e4. So the same kind of idea. Now f5, takes, takes, and again we swing over to the... Um, to the e-file and take advantage of the new weaknesses. Okay, so that's enough on that one. All right, next is um, one submitted by Blue Sun, a C player, and he says he's white in this game, and um, he's not so much interested in the tactical issues as what strikes me as ugly. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to say that much of many of the moves in the opening really strike me as uh, uh, unpleasant. So okay, there's the Chagorin, which. To, to many of us, it's aesthetically unpleasing. Here, of course, c4 is the main move. But bishop to g5 looks a little peculiar to me. Um, and I think f6 is an interesting and, and decent move. All right, bishop to f4, and now g5. And this is certainly an ugly move, but it's actually a good move. Uh, black can... Uh, well, one of the things... Let me put it this way. When, when you push pawns, a key question in ascertaining whether that pawn push is a useful space gainer or a case of overextension well what really what really um, matters in evaluating that is how well black can control the squares behind the pawn and if the, the squares behind the pawn can be well controlled then it's a good space gainer so here i think black can do that um for instance okay let's say on even bishop to e3 which might be the best move although it too is quite ugly okay e5 g3 and black can fill in the gaps. I mean, the bishop can come to e6, then I can go to g6, or you can put the bishop maybe on f5 and g6. So it's, it's not so hard for black to, to kind of cover up the gaps here. So I think g5, as gruesome looking as it is, is all right. White isn't ready to blast open the uh, the center of the king side. All right, in the game, white played bishop to g3, g4, knight h4, f5. I'm kind of inclined to, to ask if I have to keep looking. It's... it's uh, Frightening, but it's still okay. And here, maybe white should play e3, I suppose, to uh, keep the dark squares blockaded, because after h3, black missed a, a nice shot. e5. And the point is that, uh, well, f4 is a threat, and it's still a threat after d takes e5, because the knight on h4 is hanging. So, uh, in this rather perplexing position, um, White has some compensation for the piece, has two pawns, and can even take on d5, although that might might um, might boomerang on him later on. But it's better to have black here than white. All right, well, black played h5, and this is a mistake. White should just play knight to g6, and then you can take on g4, or take on f5, uh, f8 first. And, um, yeah, I mean, now, see, before it was okay, but now there are all these gaps thanks to h5. So g6 is weakened. Uh, the dark squares are weak in general, so this would turn the tables. So after e3, which was a mistake, black could have played king f7. So again, covering up the squares. So now the knight stays out of play, which means that the dark squares like e5 are under sufficient control. g6 is, of course, under control. Black is all right. 
So instead e6, a mistake. White should again play knight to g6 with the winning advantage, but played bishop to d3. And so now the game is roughly equal for a while. I think white plays a bit more successfully. And this idea of allowing the capture on g3 was, was a decent one. And um, now white gets very nice pressure on the light squares. And castle's queenside was a good move too, giving up this pawn, but getting a tremendous amount of play in return. Here, black probably should not have taken on d4. This, I think, is a bit of an error. And now white is, is very nicely mobilized, and uh, black is in serious trouble. So knight takes d5 was a good move. Okay, it's an obvious little combination, just a temporary sacrifice, but it's still good. And now white plays uh, plays well the rest of the way. Well, he's played played quite well, really, from missing knight to g6 earlier. All right, so here... White obviously has a better position, but how does he break through? What does he what does he do to to really get his army functioning at its best? Well, we want to get the rooks in play. I mean, they're on the open files, but the point of an open file is not to put it on open file, but to to advance it to some square where it can then do damage uh, horizontally. So, accordingly, White played bishop to e6 to swap off this uh, this light squared bishop, and then the rook can go to d7. And and really, this will will basically uh, get rid of or or put an end to the last line of Black's defense, or at least it's very close to doing so. So um, now f5 is under more um, more peril. The b7 pawn is imperiled, and of course, White wants to put the rook on d7 after making the swap here. So Black plays knight to d4, which is a reasonable move. White is forced to play rook takes d4, so it doesn't really deserve an exclamation point because if there's no rook takes d4, I mean, the game is just over. So we'll give bishop to e6 the exclamation point. And now here, black could have just survived, it seems, with rook to e8. So kind of a remarkable move there, but this, I think, does the trick. And uh, the, the rook on d4 is still hanging, and uh, there's, of course, a threefold attack on the bishop on e6. And this, this would help black to, uh, to counter uh, the, the, the threats from, from the white rooks. So this very good move would have kept black afloat. Instead, after queen takes d4, now it's just a collapse. So here comes the rook, and here comes the queen, and now it's just a forced mate. Whether black interposes with the rook or the queen, it comes to the same thing. Uh, of course, if king g5, queen g6 is mate. So queen f6, check, and king g6 would just hasten things by, by a couple of moves, or by a move. Rook g7 would be immediate mate. So he played king to g5, white just drives him back, and now that's mate. So good finish. I mean, uh, again, I mean, I think white played very well after missing knight to g6 here. But from this point on, I think it was very good, logical, purposeful play. But um, yeah, this opening, although it looks rather ugly for black, in fact, it was quite fine had he found um, e5, for example. Okay, on to the next game. This is submitted by black, Chris Falter, who... Um, uh, is using one of my openings, though he doesn't give me credit. So I, he, he annotates this game elsewhere on the site, and he refers to me as some um, random master friend. Uh, well, we haven't met, but uh, at least I don't think we've met, but, um, but certainly I've, I was the uh, one supplying advice. So he should, should tell the people on his own thread um, that it was me and to, to send them over to watch these, these videos. Anyway, let's, let's have a look. So he's black, he's a, a C player, his opponent's a near expert, and um, it's quite an interesting game for a while. All right, so we have the uh, the von Henning Schera Gambit, which I've I've mentioned before in these shows a few times. And um, Queen B3 is kind of an interesting sideline. So Black played Bishop to E6 correctly. And um, all right, White can take the pawn. I think I've mentioned this before. The bad news is it just leads to a draw. So um, if White plays correctly, so there are two ways to draw. One is with Queen to B5 check. Black has nothing better than bishop to d7. I mean, maybe you could play knight to d7, I guess, if you're playing someone lower rated and you've got to try for a win somehow. But the best is the bishop block, and this this perpetual is more or less forced. Uh, so that's one draw. Second drawing line, oops, sorry, after queen takes b7, knight b4, is knight to d4, covering c2, taking on d4 um, and sacking the exchange is, is not sufficient. I mean, you can try it. But objectively, it's it's not going to succeed. So the best for black is to just go for another draw like this. And white has no way of avoiding it either. No good way of avoiding it, that is. I mean, 
if you played, for instance, um, queen a6, I'll, I'll do it from here. Well, we can do it from this point. Okay, so this is, sorry. Just trying to make my uh, notation here the way I want it. Okay, so if, um, well, queen a6, sorry, you're just hanging the queen, so there's not even um, a way out there. So, and if queen f3, of course, if any move basically by the queen, this was the point that I was going to make with queen a6, any move by the queen that doesn't defend the, doesn't defend the knight or attack the uh, the rook on b8 just loses like this. Okay, so queen b7 is nothing if you're white unless you're happy with the draw. All right, so bishop to e6 and queen a4. This is the more challenging move. And here, um, I've tried a few things in the past, and I think he had too. So this was the first time he had seen it in the game that he's showing us, and he played bishop to c5, which is okay. It's a move that I tried too, I mean, and this is, let me go back to here. I mean, in the normal main line of the von Henning Schera, it goes like this. Here, here, queen e7, bishop e2, castles queen side, castles king side, g5, and so on. And white will play for, queen, for a queen side attack, black goes for the king side attack. Whoever gets there first wins. Um, so it's pretty natural in this position to think, okay, I should play bishop to c5 and maybe continue queen e7, castles long, etc., but um, it doesn't work as effectively here. All right, well, what else can you play? What I played at first when I saw this, I think, was queen to b6, or maybe after playing bishop c5 once myself in blitz, um, with the idea that, okay, I'm, I'm preventing him from bringing his, his bishop from c1 out, but still after e3 and then bishop to b4 was what I was thinking. Why place bishop to b5? And I mean, I've done, I mean, I haven't done horribly here, but I haven't been impressed with my results in blitz with this either. And more importantly, I'm not really that impressed with the positions that black gets. I mean, black gets a, a, some compensation for the pawn, but not full compensation, and, and certainly nothing that, that makes the game really entertaining. So I think the right move here is a6. And forget about queenside castling, but we're, gonna, we're just going to kick the queen here and gain some more time at its expense. So e3, b5, queen c2, put the rook on c8, all right, and now let's suppose white plays something like a3. Okay, this isn't forced, but it's illustrative of um, what can happen, and it makes sense. I mean, black is at least kind of threatening to threaten to play b4, and if knight a4, then knight to d4, for example, with the idea of knight to c2 check. So let's say a3. All right, queen d7 now, with the idea of bishop to f5. All right, bishop to e2, bishop f5, and now suppose white plays e4, kind of asking what black is up to. Well, we'll see that same idea again. Knight takes e4, and if knight e4, then knight to b4, followed by knight to c2 check, assuming the queen moves away. Black ends up the exchange ahead. So probably better for white is bishop to d3 after the pawn sack, but then knight to g3 proves to be just fine. Bishop takes, queen takes, 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 and black is equal, and um, certainly at least equal. I mean, maybe... If white doesn't do anything too incisive, he could end up being a little bit better because he's got a little bit more space. And um, the pawn structure at least could very easily end up favoring blacks, black slightly because the queenside pawns are on the opposite color of his bishop. Whites aren't. All right. There is, of course, much more that could be analyzed here with a6, but I think this is the right way to go. a6, b5. All right. So in the game, bishop c5, um, e3, castles, bishop b2, a6 castles b5. Now here white played queen of d1 which uh, Falter doesn't say anything about but it should be said that queen h4 is better. Um, it makes more sense for the white queen to remain active. If he'd wanted to go to d1 well he could have done that a long time ago but but also the queen is well placed on h4 and um, you can see a number of ways in which white could, could whip up some activity here. Rook to d1 and bishop to d3. So that's one way in which it, it's clear that it makes sense for white to keep the uh, the d1 square open for another piece. Um, also, you could have ideas like b3, bishop to b2, and then knight to g4, followed by a knight going to e4. So white can point his pieces at the black king, and all right, I mean, it's not that black should, by, should be panicking here by any, any means, but with the queen on d1, it quickly becomes clear that there's a logical way for white to, to continue the development of his pieces and to, to have some play. All right, so after queen d1, black should have no problems here. 
All right, here uh, Falter makes a comment that in retrospect he thinks the rooks are better on d8 and c8, and I would agree, although I think white still has chances for an edge there. So, for instance, like this. So I'm not sure maybe that the rook on d8 needs to get, get, get there straight away. Um, if, for instance, you take and play knight a5, kind of like the game, uh, maybe bishop to b6 is better, but knight a5, b4, knight b3, rook over, takes, takes, takes. After something like queen to e1, I like white's position a little bit more thanks to the uh, long-range potential of the bishop here, or long-term potential, I should say. Maybe long-range also. Anyway, white played, or black played rook a to d8, which, yeah, this makes the least sense, I think. I mean, c8 for sure for, for the one rook, and the second rook, maybe d8, maybe e8, maybe wait and see. Queen c2. And, all right, here he criticizes knight a5, and, um, yeah, but it's not clear what he thinks is, oh, now he thinks rook to d6 might might be a bit better. Um, I would probably say rook to c8, just admit the mistake. But um, I think, in general, in his notes, he very, uh, very much overestimates black's position. So, yeah, black has a little more space here, but this isn't like... Um, game 16 of the uh, the 1986 match, was it? I forget if it was the 85 or 86 match, uh, the Karpov-Kasparov match. The the famous game where black has this knight on d3, and it just um, suffocates the white position. I mean, fantastic game, one of the best games of all time. Uh, this is not that. So white's position is a little bit passive, but I don't see what black's targets are. I mean, white's position is fundamentally sound, Black has a little more space, but it's not a tremendous amount of extra space. And white can just play rook to d1 and b4 and bishop to b2. And, and what is what has black got? So, yeah, I mean, white has to be a little careful. But, you know, I, I think this is just um, black trying to keep keep white bottled up. Uh, I don't think there's any, any clear attacking plan here for black. I really don't. But to the extent that there is, I would play rook to c8 and um, at least threaten to threaten stuff on the uh, the c-file, at least bluff at threats there. So maybe rook c8, drop the bishop back somewhere, whether to b6 or a7, or in some cases even to d6, and um, and then look for some some way of making progress after white commits. So for instance, if, if white plays, if Fianchetto's is, is dark square bishop, then we can look for tricks against the e3 square. But um, if he plays bishop to d2, well, okay, then... Then maybe we can put a rook on the d file. I mean, we have to be reactive. I think another idea: once the bishop's out of play or out of play, out of the way, on a square like a7 or b6, then we could consider knight a5, followed by putting the knight on b3 or maybe the bishop on b3. So that I think, <coughs> excuse me, makes sense. So knight a5 is, I think, just too direct, and really just leads nowhere. So. Um, Black's got the bishop pair now, but but white's comfortable, has more space, so uh, has more space than he had before. All right, and now knight to g5 is okay. Maybe knight to e4 is even better. All right. So here I think um, black should play knight to g4, and I think this maintains some compensation. After bishop f5, so this this trades off white's superfluous knight. Now e4. Okay, um, so here he talks about having more, having some fun with bishop to h3. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think white's just better. And, and he suggests that bishop to g6 is probably better too. But, but really, again, I think fundamentally white is just completely fine here. I mean, black has, again, a little bit of compensation. I mean, the dark square bishop is a nice piece. But really, it's all about whether white just consolidates and wins at this point. I mean, there's, there, there's no sort of liveliness in the black position. There's no target. I mean, there's no no real weakness that white has. So I, I think, again, black just keeps fundamentally overestimating his, his prospects in uh, in this this um, middle game. So bishop h3, knight d5, queen g5. And, um, yeah, here instead of queen to e2, why not just rook f to d1? So we, we get out of the way so we could play g3 if need be at any time. And I, I really don't see any compensation for black. I mean, black has, you know, uh, some good pieces, but so does white. And um, again, what ultimately does black have in return for the pawn? 
you know, chances to hold the position, but nothing, no, let's say, positive compensation, just reasonable chances to, to hold to make it difficult for white to make decisive progress. All right, so queen e2, rook f to e8. And here, all right, uh, white played rook c to d1, and now black criticizes himself, rightly so, for not playing bishop takes g2, which is about equal. So takes, rook takes d5, so a little tactic there. And something like this should just be a, an easy draw. You don't, of course, have to play d5, d6, but to, to grab some space, uh, it's not a bad bad thing to, to clear clear some lines for the pieces and to drive the rook back. Anyway, <clears throat> this should be a pretty easy draw for white to hold, but certainly at least it's white who has to hold it. But um, why not criticize white? I mean, it's, I don't know, I sort of have the feeling in the game as if black just assumed that everything good that happened to him was his birthright for playing this gambit, and, and I just strenuously disagree. I mean, you gotta, it, it's, you have to be an optimist when you play gambits, but certainly after the game, when you're analyzing it, you, you need to be uh, more objective. So optimism when you're the, when you're playing them, absolutely. But you know, if if you want to uh, make sure you don't get in trouble for the next game, be objective. And and here I think if White again plays something like Queen D3 or Queen C2, just sidestepping this Rook takes D5 trick, then I I don't know what what Black has. I mean, so again, same thing. Black's pieces are all in good squares, but okay, they're there, and now there's nothing for them to do. So if, if they don't have anything to do, then the danger is that white just keeps making moves to improve his position. Moves the rook from f1, maybe plays g3, penetrates on the c file, and step by step uses his extra pawn and the, the great knight on d5 to convert the advantage. Anyway, the game went rook c to d1, f5, um, here maybe queen d2, again getting out of the way of all of this. But all right, white is still doing just fine. Knight to d5. And and here, yeah, he, he notes that black had to play rook to e8 to retain reasonable drawing ch um, chances. All right, I, I don't know if, how reasonable, but there, whatever drawing chances there are, I would agree. Rook to e8 is what will make them happen. But still, let's take a position like this. I mean, this is really kind of one-way traffic here, um, and it's just whether white wins or not. To tell the truth, I mean, I don't know if it's a win, but I would be really upset with myself if I failed to win this with white. Um, maybe, maybe I wouldn't. I, I would forgive myself if Carlson was black. But if I were playing a peer and I didn't win this, I would. I would be very upset. But rook f7 um, certainly makes life easy for white. So now e5, and this pawn just runs down the board, and black is busted. Uh, e7 is even better than h3. And okay, here he points out the bishop to b8, b8 is better, but it's doesn't matter. White's just completely winning here. And here Black resigned. So a very interesting game, certainly a very interesting opening. Uh, again, though, I would caution, I mean, unless White has some weakness in his position, uh, it's very, very difficult to really claim that Black's compensation is, is full. And, and that's why in the main line of this, uh, of the, the Von Henning share gambit, it's different because you castle on opposite sides and so black can push the pawns on the king side and, and force a weakness. But if, if black is castling king side too, it's a lot harder to, to, to induce some kind of problem. So that's why I think this line is, is very interesting for white with queen b3 and then um, queen a4. But again, this, this pawn roller is probably, is probably what will give black his best chance. Trying to use the advantage in development and if to defend, white has to make some concessions, then black can make progress from there. Okay, so that's um, quite a bit about this one. Let's move to the next one. We'll try to be a bit quicker. Also, especially since this is from Prospero, who already got one question in. So um, let's, uh, I'll try not to be too long-winded on this this one. So he asks about the, uh, what we could call the Budapest Gambit Decline with D5. And he notes that the uh, the books on this all kind of dismiss it and say that black gets an equal game Maybe, but as he points out, well, you still have to play it. And, um, you know, what do you do after this? And, and White has a number of setups. So, um, and in particular, he's curious, okay, you know, should you play for e4? He, he kind of thinks you should. He likes uh, setting up a battery with a bishop on c5 and a queen on b6. Another idea is for black to, to try to go for f5 and, and kingside play. And he's also curious, okay, well, should black go for c6 at some point? 
And what should the uh, the black queen bishop and queen knight do? And it seems that they can get in each other's way. Well, so I'll just offer some very brief suggestions here. Uh, and in part, I mean, it, it feels like it's, it might be a little bit too soon to really comment because, as he notes, I mean, white can go for a variety of setups. Um, and just to mention some, actually there's an even bigger variety than he mentions, but he mentions a few too. Um, you know, does white play e4? I mean, not right now, but does he play for e4 or does he play for e3? Maybe he finchettos uh, with g3. Does he bring the bishop from c1 out to g5? Or does he let it stay behind a pawn on e3? You know, do the knights go to c3 and f3, or c3 and e2, or f3 and d2? So with so many different ways that white can can uh, construct his position, it's hard to just kind of give a one-size-fits-all um, approach. So I'll just offer some brief lines and, um, you know, leave it to his experience, which I think is is on the right track. All right, now one move that might be possible instead of bishop to c5, I'll, I'll mention, whoops, is bishop to b4 check. So this isn't mentioned, but it's logical because if, um, well, given the pawn on e5 and that black will most likely play d6 at some point, this bishop becomes a nominally bad bishop. And even if it's outside of the pawn chain, it's still a bad bishop. So if, if white, for instance, offers to, uh, to swap it off, not with knight to d2, but with bishop to d2, well, then we're happy. We, we just take this guy and play d6, and we've traded off our bad bishop while white is stuck with um, his bad bishop. So this would become kind of a favorable Bogo Indian, in effect. Um, so knight to d2, I think, is a more logical move. All right, so castles, d6, or sorry, g3, d6, bishop g2, queen e7. And here, maybe we, 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 keep, the, uh, we, we keep our bishop after all since he's fianchetto, since playing e3 would be a bit weakening. So let's say queen c2 and then a5. So something like this is possible, and here, indeed, especially on a move like e3, but even without it, we might consider a plan involving knight to g4 and f5. Probably this knight will come to a6 to stay out of the way, and if the bishop drops back, then it can come into play through c5. All right, just a possible continuation. Okay, so bishop to b4 check is worth considering. Bishop to c5 is, of course, the main move here. It's the most obvious-looking move. And it has the uh, crude tactical point that bishop to g5 just blunders upon to bishop takes f2 check because king f2, you can check on g4 or e4, doesn't matter. And black is at least clearly better, probably just winning. So knight c3, this is the, uh, the natural move to make. And now d6. Okay, well, bishop to g5 is still impossible because bishop f2 and then knight to g4 check. Uh, white could play h3, but that's pretty uninspiring, and um, frankly, I would be perfectly happy to play anything against that, maybe c6. Maybe you could even play h6. It, it just really doesn't matter a lot. Anyway, um, if e3, bishop to f5. If e4, then I think knight to g4 is good. Knight h3, castles. Bishop b2, queen h4, castles, and now to stop bishop to g5, take time out with h6. But uh, I'll probably follow up with either f5 or maybe knight h6, taking advantage of the uh, the knight being stuck on h3. So we're threatening to take on, on h3 then with our bishop. So black should be a little bit better here. Finally, another idea after d6 is, um, oh, well, if h3 again, we should play bishop to f5. And finally, if queen is c2, Let's castle, knight f3, a5, a3, knight a6. All right, if um, e3 again, maybe some plan with knight to g4 would make sense, or move the knight somewhere else and play f5. If bishop to g5, I think we can just kick it a couple of times here. Certainly the peace sacrifices are, are nonsense. And on bishop to g3, e4. This is pretty good. We may um, either keep the pawn on e4 or consider e3. And if um, knight takes e4, well, we know Zark, the uh, dark square bishop, f4 is coming. And no, we don't necessarily have to take it right away. So we're, we're not going to be in a rush to open the h-file, although, to be honest, I don't really um, think it's so uh, terribly serious. Um, I, I should say, okay, after queen to c2, we're, we're not necessarily going to rush to play f4 because then queen g6 check will win. But we play queen to f6, I think. And now on e3... 
Well, okay, maybe we don't want to play f4 just yet because takes, takes, bishop h4. But this bishop is, is still stuck. And I think after bishop to d7, we can just keep building up. Maybe we could play a4, drop this guy back, and play knight c5. And um, black is still, in effect, playing, a, playing on a bishop ahead, even if we're not winning. And I mean, white could play h4. But the, uh, the key point is that this bishop is going to be out of play more or less no matter what. So this is a great position for black here. Okay, so that's um, a little bit of an idea, but let me also say that the lines that you were proposing are generally pretty sensible as well. So, um, yeah, it's there's more that needs to be figured out by black than just three bishop to c5, and the game wins itself, certainly, but it's uh, also early enough that we can't really be too precise and just give you know, one a one-size-fits-all rejoinder. All right, next one. This is from Josh Winterberg, also known as Flint Eastwood. And if I feel lucky today, I'll answer the questions that he asks. So what he wants to know is, um, well, okay, I'll just read his comment or part of it. So he says, I've, I've recently been having pretty good play against players quite a, quite a bit above my rating in rapid time controls. He's just under 1,700. And he's been winning or at least getting decent play against players around 2,000. So he adds, I feel like my strategic play has really come on. But having looked at some games I lost recently, I can also see my biggest feeling at the moment. I get so obsessed with one plan that I often miss, miss the opportunity to switch gears and convert a slight strategic advantage in, in one area in attack or into an attack in another. And he gives this um, recent game as an example where he became so fixated with the idea of occupying the d5 square with a piece that he missed um, the chance to create what he calls a dead point on d5 in exchange for opening up the light squared bishop and getting kingside play. And he's right about that. But I think um, in, in some other ways, maybe too, he was um, insufficiently focused on strategic aspects of the game. All right, so let's, let's have a look. So he's white, and his opponent is good old NN. So here we have um, a classical Sicilian. F3 is... Okay, it's, it's a playable line. And after e5, though, the move here is knight to b3. And white can play in English attack style if he so desires with bishop b3, queen d2, g4, etc. But instead he played knight d to b5. And, and this, it looks like a Sveshnikov, but f2, f3 is, is just, well, it's, it's worse than worthless, I think, because it's, it's even weakening some squares around the, uh, around the king side. So I think this is not a good, not a good choice, not a good... Um, decision here to switch into a Sveshnikov style of, of play. So knight b3 I think is definitely better, or knight to b3. Now, one difference, you might wonder, well, okay, if this is the case, why not, in the regular old Sveshnikov, why not play knight b3 or, for instance, knight to f3 here? Well, the answer is that black should play not d6. If d6, then either bishop to c4, or bishop to g5, and white would stand better, but bishop to b4. And this is why it's important here to play knight d to b5, because now if bishop to b4, well, you can play knight to d6 check, or better, I think, a3. Um, they're both good. So knight to d6 check as well. All right, so you don't get that option, or black doesn't have that option here after knight d to b5. You can't play bishop to b4, but f3 is itself um, already a concession from white. And after a6 and then b5, I think black is at least equal here and maybe even a little bit better. All right, white played knight to d5. Again, pretending it's a Sveshnikov. But here, with knight takes d5, I think black is better. Um, if queen takes d5, then queen c7, followed by bishop to e6 or bishop to b7 maybe. And um, again, I mean, white is a long, long way away from using the d5 square the way he wants. I mean... The queen is not designed for that square. The bishop isn't going to get there. And it's going to take the knight a while. C3, knight C2, knight E3, knight D5. Okay. Um, oh, and if E takes D5, which I should say, you know, it's not just in the game, the tactical point that we'll see later on, but sometimes playing E takes D5 is, all, is quite all right. Um, a game that I recommend to students often to, to take a look at is Geller against Fisher from the 1962 Candidates in Curacao. I mean, there were two games where Geller had white. Um, I think he only won one of them. The other game, I think, was ended in a draw. Uh, 
but it's it was from a knight orf. But Gellert takes on d5. He has a pawn on a5, I think. And there's this general queenside advance with a 4-on-3 majority. And uh, his play is very, very nice and um, compelling. So take a look at that as an example of, of what white is trying for with the pawn on d5. I mean, it's not just, um, you know, put the piece on d5 and there's no other possible plan for white. Or, you know, if, if the pawn goes to d5, then white has basically blown it. Not necessarily the case at all. So have a look at that game. Anyway, in this position, I think after knight to e7 or knight to d4, black has either a slight advantage or something very close to a slight advantage. Certainly the, the easier play. So bishop to e6, while not really bad, isn't maybe to the point. And here white could play c3 or c4. He chose bishop to g5. Okay, bishop to e7, takes. And here black chose to recapture with the pawn. And it's clear from how he played this that he really didn't know what he was doing. So bishop takes f6 would be the normal approach. And especially since white has played f3, I mean, now if this bishop gets to survive, I mean, if white doesn't take, then this guy comes here. And again, if he can kind of circle in here at some point, this is great. Or queen d7 takes at some moment, the bishop goes to d8 and b6, which is a known idea in the Sveshnikov in, in any case. Or... It doesn't have to be the bishop on e6. You could play knight e7 after bishop g5, <coughs> swap that guy, and then try to get the bishop, the dark squared bishop, on the a7 g1 diagonal. And um, white can have some problems thanks to f2, f3. I mean, white never plays this move in a regular Sveshnikov. Anyway, g takes f... Oh, the other thing I was going to say, sorry, was after... Um, let me get rid of all this stuff. After an, an inevitable bishop to g6, black goes for f5 and recaptures with a pawn or g6 and f5. All right, and in any, all of these cases, black, I think, gets good play. So after g takes f6, it's all right, but after c3, black really should play f5 now. <clears throat> and that's the idea of f5, or sorry, the g takes f6 capture, is to play play this, and you have the option of double dipping. Uh, of course, you know, you want to do some developing first, maybe castle, uh, move the queen to d7, play king h8. But sooner or later, this idea of um, swapping the first f-pawn and bringing the second one out, opening up lines on the king side, and trying to enjoy a, a complete central majority can be a very effective plan. After castles, though, now white can blockade and prevent f5, and, and then white should, of course, be better. So queen d3. Now, here black played a, an absolutely terrible move. Bishop takes d5, and this is the moment that um, Josh was referring to, where he should absolutely play e takes d5, forgetting about occupying the d5 square and noticing that black is going to get destroyed on the uh, on the light squares on the king side. So for instance, knight a5, queen e4, king g7, bishop d3, rook h8. And here he gives some line, <coughs> excuse me, that starts with queen g4 check and ends up not making sense. I think he maybe misses some moves along the way. But anyway, instead of queen g4 check, which is okay, um, I think just castling is fine, or even my pref preference would be knight c2. Let's get this guy right into the action here. Just uh, embed this knight on f5, and black is going to choke to death. I mean, white's better in the center on the king side, and can even bring his attention back to the queen side at some point with a4. So this would have been just uh, terrific for white. So instead he played queen takes d5 which, again, is not as good. I mean, he had a, a, a concrete advantage to be gained there, but I think there's still something to be said about the rest of this, too. So queen to b6, a logical move, defending the knight, and aiming at e3. So knight c2 makes sense. And here I think black should play b4, uh, opening up lines on the queen side, which is where he would normally open lines anyway. And um, and also this starts to, to, to raise some questions about what the white king is going to do in, 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 the, uh, in the future. Castle and queenside will clearly be out of out of bounds, but with the uh, queen sitting on b6, castle and kingside won't be at least trivially easy unless he retreats the queen. Um, all right, so rook a to c8, queen d2, king h8. Yeah, and here I think white makes another peculiar move. So he plays queen to e3. Knight to e3. I mean, this was the plan that was already mentioned, and I would just say put it in action. Knight to, the knight will be fantastic on either d5 or f5. And, um, you know, and then, then the position is, is starting to work again pretty nicely. 
So queen e3 really misplaces the queen. I mean, maybe maybe he was counting on black trading queens, but no reason for him to do so. I mean, white's behind in development. His king is uh, kind of iffy. So this is, I think, a good move. And now white played a4, which is strategically desirable. But again, I mean, I'm thinking, what about your king, man? You know, get, get that guy out of the center already. So b takes a4. Here white should play rook takes a4. Um, yeah, black can play a5. But in the long run, I mean, you'll be able to exert some pressure against that that guy. So bishop a6, and now rook to b8. And this is this is uncomfortable. This is really unpleasant. So rook to b1, queen a5. This is all right, but even better is f5. And and now, you know, all the lines are going to get open. So the bishop can maybe come to g5 or h4 in some positions. Uh, if e takes f5, he can play d5. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, the, the board is just about to explode here, and it's not going to be exploding in a good way for white. So queen a5 is also a logical move, but it's not as good. And here, white blundered with bishop to d3. Rook takes b2, and the rest is simple. Another blunder here. Knight to b4 would have been best, but knight to d4 is okay, too. And here, down a rook, uh, or sorry, down a, down a full piece and a pawn, uh, white resigned. But, um, yeah, I mean, he bemoans the tactic, and he said, well, why did the, the tactic arrive? And he says, well, because I failed to seize the initiative when the opportunity arose. But, but no, I think that's wrong. I mean, you're certainly right that e, that e takes d5 seven moves before would have been better, but there were plenty of places to improve along the way, I mean, before that. So knight to e3 is a better move than queen e3. So this puts the knight on a perfect square, and also you can... Um, play bishop b2 and castle, and then play knight d5 or knight f5 after you move your king to the corner. Um, here, rook takes a4 would have been an improvement. So, no, I mean, it's not just that you missed, um, I mean, that's what let him off the hook, but the tactic didn't arise because you missed e takes d5. The tactic arose because you, you didn't finish your development, because you allowed black to get counterplay and didn't do anything to neutralize it. So things like that. So... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's two different things, and you're right to, to focus or, or to, to note that, that um, you were too focused on the, uh, the light squared plan with d5 to, uh, to catch e takes d5, but, but there, there are a number of things going on. So very interesting game, a lot of lessons you can learn from it, so, uh, and I think a good game to submit to. Thank you for it. Okay, so I think we've got one or two more. Yeah, two more. So the next game is against Oz Smurf, and... Um, all right, let me see. I think he has some questions that he poses at the end of the game. Yeah, all right. So the first one he asks, he, he's white, and he's a high B player, almost class A, but not quite, against um, a C player. All right, so here, yeah, he asks what I think about F4. And um, I would like F4 more if your bishop wasn't on G5, frankly. So here, um, I think black has a few pretty decent ideas. All right, one idea that I was curious about not my main one, but I think it's at least interesting, is d5. And then on e5 to play knight e4. So it uh, looks like something that should be good for white, but it's not much better for white. So takes, 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 takes. And this e-pawn is at least um, both surprisingly resilient, and black gets some, some play while white is going after it. So can note, for instance, that there are queen to b4 check ideas in the air. So let's say knight to c3. Castle's queen e2. So again, it looks as if, well, the pawn is just a goner, and um, life is great for white. Black has a bad bishop on c8. Happy days, right? Not yet. f5. If white doesn't take, then black should be reasonably happy. And, and this bishop is not bad, in fact, because he can play b6 and not put it on b7, but go to a6. So there are some prospects for it. I mean, it's not a fantastic piece, but it's not, it's not, uh, not dead wood either. So, after f5, we should grab en passant, queen f6, and now, hey, lo and behold, we've got a double attack. We're hitting both of these guys. So queen e4, queen f4, maybe knight f3, and this position is not that much better for white. It's pretty close to equal. Of course, the advantage for white is this pawn on e6. It's a bit sickly. That's true. But black will have very, very good, very clean development. Has a, the bishop will be nice if the pawn on e6 does, in fact, drop. So it's um, not really clear that white has uh, anything too serious there. That's playable for black. But I think my main choice here would be e5, just taking the bull by the horns. And 
it, I'm not sure that White's development is really sufficient here for the, the position to be opened up, or at least to keep control as the position opens. For example, okay, if knight f3, then we just take and play knight c6, and black might even be a little bit better here, frankly. The bishop on g5 just really doesn't, doesn't fit. Also, if f takes e5, uh, one idea I was fascinated by initially was just knight takes e4, with the idea takes, takes, and if bishop b4, queen, and h4, check, regaining the piece, and of course black is better here. But if white just plays more calmly with knight f3, then he should stand better. So instead, black should recapture on e5. And um, here the capture on e5, or the further capture on e5, is completely fine for black. I mean, black should be at least equal in such a position. So I don't think f4 is really the solution to um, all of white's um, dreams here, or the answer to all of white's uh, goals and aspirations. So knight f3, knight c6, castles, castles, c3. And here he rightly asked about the move e5. So yeah, I think this is the uh, the principled way to go here. And right, in such positions, I mean, white's bishops, I think, are both slightly misplaced. I mean, the bishop does nothing on d3, and the bishop on g5 is a slight tactical liability. And what I mean in particular is that after d5, which I think would be the normal way to proceed, trying to uh, kind of King's Indianify the... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the position, certainly the structure gets King's Indian, uh, knight to b8. Well, here, further King's Indianification, if I can keep uh, making this horrible verb, uh, may, is met by knight takes d5. And so that's what I mean by uh, my reference to the um, misplaced bishop on g5. So if bishop takes e7, knight takes e7, or of course if white takes on d5 with either pawn, then bishop takes g5. But white should play bishop to e3 instead. And now, if knight to g4, uh, kind of ironically or amusingly, and really similar, I, I think, to um, some main kings Indian lines, you just drop the bishop back to c1. You may play h3 later and then make a return trip to e3. I kind of like better, uh, like c6 better for black. And then, let's say c4, and now knight to a6. Again, with kings Indian style play and I have no idea what the uh, proper evaluation is. I mean, I suspect black shouldn't be worse here, or um, at least shouldn't be much worse. So it's not really a King's Indian proper, of course, because the bishop's on e7, but it's very, very much like a king, King's Indian, and um, I think black is okay. So d5 is is probably what I would recommend, and it's just an interesting game. Um, if h3 to stop bishop to g4. So the point of h3 would be to maintain the pawn on d4 to try to keep kind of a Rui Lopez style center. And of course in the main line of the Rui Lopez, white plays h3 to prevent bishop to g4 so he can keep the pawn intact on d4. So we can keep that nice um, two, two pawn duo there on, C, on d4 and e4. Well on this, um, d5 is interesting but probably not best. I think white should play bishop takes f6 here. One plan that is interesting, I think, is knight h5. Uh, black would be very happy to trade off the dark squared bishops. It's his bad bad piece. And um, even if the bishop retreats to e3, the black knight will go to f4 with good play, I think. Finally, another idea, again, taking advantage of the stupid bishop on g5, is e takes d4, c takes d4, and now knight takes e4. So this, this again, if bishop takes e4, bishop takes g5. So bishop e7, queen e7. And I think white gets decent play for the pawn, but not more than that. After either knight c3 takes and takes, or rook e1, d5, and now knight c3 takes, takes, queen d6, and for instance, maybe queen to c2. But um, yeah, probably black is... Well, I would say that white has to at least prove that the compensation will will survive. So I think white does have decent compensation, but I would probably rather have black in a slow game. I'd rather have white, I think, maybe in a blitz game. All right, so that's what I want to say about um, e5 here, and I think he's completely right to focus on that. All right, let's move ahead a bit. And white definitely is better now. He's made it, managed to maintain his center. Black isn't swapping off any pieces, so white definitely has a, a superior position he took. Uh, d5 I think is good too, but knight takes g5 
followed by f4 is certainly fine. And yeah, around here, white misses some opportunities. So he played queen f3 uh, with a decent idea in mind, but it just fails tactically. So I think the right thing to do here is g4. Well, let's come back to this, because you'll see why in a moment. So queen f3 was played in the game, and here black played a very good move, f5, after which he's just a little bit worse. So white played e5, cutting off the knight on h5. And it looks great. He's going to play bishop to e2 or g4. But black uh, found a very good resource. I mean, this is especially impressive considering that he was a c player. I mean, I could imagine a much stronger player just folding up, you know, just folding the shop here. But um, he found a great defense. So knight to e7 and then bishop to c6, taking advantage of the, uh, the problem that white has on g2. Queen h5, queen takes g2 as mate. And after queen f2, knight to d5, black was completely fine. All right, so now let's go back. Instead of queen f3, g4, I think, is better. So let's say he plays king h8, just as a kind of um, waste to move thing here. Queen e2, f5. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not actually a waste to move. There, there's a concrete reason, which is that if black plays f5 right away, then ef, ef, and then queen to b3 check followed by taking on b7. Okay, black can't take on g4 because his queen would hang. So this is, that was the, the reason for um, king h8. So now queen e2, f5, e5, like we saw in the game, knight e7, and now king f2. And um, in this version, with the uh, the pawn being the, the unit that goes after the knight on h5 rather than a bishop, there's no... Um, queen to g2 make kinds of worries. All right, so let's say bishop to c6. Here you could probably play rook to g1, but you could also just take the knight because after queen g2 check king e1, black has nothing. I mean, he can take the pawn on h3, but that's it. He just gets one pawn for the uh, the piece, and he's losing. Okay, finally, my third option here is knight f6. Just going back, getting out of the way. Uh, again, right, this thing is clearly better for white. So knight f6, queen f3, and now, okay, white has this enormous space advantage. He'll play e5 at some point, or f5, or g5, or maybe all of them, <laughs> and black is black is just suffering here. I mean, this is a, a horrible position for him. So white had a good idea, but it should have been prefaced by g4 first. Okay, so at this point, as I said, black is equal. And here he asked if black's queen takes h4 was a strategic error. And I would say no. I think queen takes h4 is a perfectly good move. So um, the only weakness that black has is the pawn on e6. But it's very easy for him to, 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 to defend it and even to shield it. I mean, he could play, for instance, knight to b6, threatening knight c4, knight a4, and after b3, bishop to e4. And the question is now, well, what weakness? The only weakness I see is... Uh, White's minor pieces. I mean, the knight on h4 is, is poorly placed, and the bishop on h2 is really awful. So, okay, instead black played king to h7, knight f3, rook g8. Okay, and um, here white should have dealt with the threat of knight to a4 with b3, played king e2. Okay, black should play knight a4. So anyway, we have a few moves where this is missed. Um, here I would like this better, I think. But all right, we'll just kind of move things along here. So in this position, I think it's still equal. Um, black had some chances to be better, but now he should be fine. Uh, but white slowly makes a little bit of progress. Not a lot, but a bit. Okay, here I think black should just play knight a8 right away, and then knight c7, knight to e6. All right, and here I would prefer a4 to c5. So I don't think that white should be uh, hasty to foreclose the option of playing c takes d5. You never know. You know, maybe white could play at some point um, rook a to, or sorry, rook c to g1, force rook to g8, d to g8, and then take on d5, depending on what else is going on, or play h5, king f7, and then take. So maybe a4 here, drive the knight back, or maybe the knight volunteer, vol voluntarily goes back to a8, and then we go rook c to g1, h5, and then take on, on um, d5, and then swing the rooks back to the c file. So you don't want to you know, reduce your own options unless you absolutely have to, or unless you're just sure that 
the way you're going is going to give you everything you want. All right, so we get to this position here, white played rook to h1. And now, um, this is like one of the earlier games that we looked at. Uh, white engages in kind of an annotational practice that I, I, I don't think is very good. So he, he, okay, after king to g7, he bemoans the fact that he did not play rook to h5 here um, and played bishop to f2, f2 instead. And, and he's right about that. Um, but he should be just as fair-minded and note that rook to h5 is no threat here. It only becomes a threat after this blunder king to g7. So if black plays knight to c7, then white's not better either. Just rook to h5, king e6, and, and white has nothing. I mean, black is 100% equal here. So we just have this sequence of blunders where both sides miss it, but Oz Smurf uh, only notes his own um, failure here to, to find rook h5. So again, black should play, yeah, here black should play rook to g4. So on rook h5, there's king to g6. So instead he played knight c7. Again, white had rook to h5. It misses it. Um, and white misses it in turn. Okay, and here black played knight to b5. So here I would just play knight to e6 with black and just kind of sit on the position. I mean, rook to g4 next, and and then you can either just sit or you can play for b6 and, and try for some play if you want to, but probably better to just wait. So knight to b5, bishop f2. Again, rook to g4, and then rook h5 is nothing because of king g6. So finally, white, oh no, white still doesn't see it. Okay, he plays a4. Rook h5 is probably better there too. Again, rook to g4 would take care of the problem, but he played knight e4, and finally, white sees rook h5. And yeah, now at this point, things are good for white, although not quite as good as they were in the other cases, because black got the uh, the pawn. Well, black should play for play as fast as possible. He should play b6. I mean, if he just waits for white's two connected pass pawns in the center, they're going to steamroller him. They're going to kill him. So he's got to get his own pawns going. b6 is the way to go. All right, so instead he played knight a5. And, okay, now he should again play knight c4 check and b6. Get these doggies rolling down the board. Takes, takes, f5, rook g4, rook h4, h5. And if takes, then check and... Black has, has chances here. Okay, the game is definitely not over at this point. But white is definitely for choice. All right, after knight to b3, f5, now it's it's over, except that white lost on time a few moves later. But positionally, it's over, and white played very well the rest of the way. Yeah, and um, again, white lost on time, but in a completely winning position. So um, an interesting game, but I mean, really, it was basically equal for most of the ending, and it was just that um, he overlooked rook to h5 one time more than you did, and um, after that, that, that more or less made the difference. Okay, but a very interesting game. Um, again, the opening, I think uh, f4 is, is perhaps a bit premature, that black can get good play against that, and um, and later, ironically, you, you should have pushed, pushed the pawn that time with g4. So, um, all right, interesting game. Let's uh, move on, I think, to our last game. And, okay, this was submitted by Ross Hittenden, who's a C player, who played a very good game here in a, in a Grand Prix attack. So I'm going to kind of zip ahead. He didn't really ask any specific questions. He just kind of um, just posted the game to the, uh, to, the, to the site. Okay, so here, yeah, all of this has been played before. Various moves have been tried. Queen F2 has been tried. Uh, sorry, queen to h4 has been tried, and bishop to d2 has been played. Um, all right, with various results. But queen to g3 is what he played here. And it's, on the one hand, it's kind of interesting. So the idea is clearly to play f5 and to dissuade black from taking um, on f5 twice, where that would be with anything. So with, let's say, e takes f5, e takes f5, knight f5 because of rook h5, Oh, sorry, rook f5 and bishop h6 kinds of ideas. May not work immediately, but maybe bishop to g5 first, and then bishop to f6 or bishop h6 would win. So it's a sensible idea, although I'm not sure if black takes takes it, um, defends against that threat, whether the queen is best on g3. The knight might be best there. You might want to play pawn to g4, or you might want the queen on h4 to support at some point, um, the bishop going to h6. Be that as it may, 
black played d5, white played e5, queen b6 was good, queen f2, and here rather than knight to c6, which is not a blunder, certainly, but it draws the knight away from the king side, and the knight really doesn't do anything on c6, and it also blocks, I mean, it defends the pawn on d4, but it's purely passive there, and it's also clo closing the c file to black's rooks. So I prefer one of two things, knight f5, certainly very logical, and if g4, you can drop the knight on e3, so that's no problem. The other idea is to counterattack with f6. White can take the pawn. Now let's say queen c6. And black is going to get a lot of play here very quickly. Something like this, for example. And now you can see black's pieces are beautiful. Uh, white has to be careful about both bishops. The one good thing for white is that maybe he doesn't have to worry about both bishops simultaneously, although there might be tricks like bishop to h4, too to induce g3 and then d4 and black's got the rotor rooter thing going here so it's um, it's a very very nice position for black he's definitely got very good compensation for the pawn so knight c6 i think is not really the best uh white could also consider c3 here showing that if if he really wants to he's going to win that pawn anyway so that's another reason to uh, dislike knight to, to c6 Anyway, white played knight to g3, black played f6, takes, and now a uh, strange move by black, bishop takes f6. I mean, rook takes f6, I think, is much more natural. Um, you know, the bishop is where it belongs, and this protects the e6 pawn and prepares to double on the f-file, so I would definitely choose this way. All right, and now the move that I think is uh, the move that Ross was most interested in. I mean, he had suggested this to me uh, earlier. And um, it's a very nice pawn sack, f5. Here, black has to, I think, be very careful. But I think with proper play, black should be at least equal. So you might even want to make this a little quiz for yourself if, you're, if you still have enough energy left after this long video. So this is, this is the final game, by the way, that we're covering. So um, here, black has uh, at least three options that are decent, I think. Um, two that are, I think, better. Okay, and one that's best. So g takes f5, I don't really like so much. Knight h5, queen c7, rook e1, queen d7, bishop h6, rook f7, and now white can play on both wings with a4. So black has got his extra pawn, but white white's position is just obviously a lot more comfortable. Black has to be really careful that this d5, e6, f5 thing doesn't break apart because that would open up a lot of lines. So black is probably all right here, but it's uh, definitely a lot more fun to have white in this position. All right, uh, another move that makes sense is bishop to g7, pinning the f pawn and putting the bishop back where it belonged in the first place. Bishop to g5, I think, makes sense. And um, all right, if g takes f5, then knight h5, and e takes f5, hangs the d pawn, so knight e5 might be the best move now. This way the bishop on b7 protects the d5 pawn, and knight to g4 followed by knight to e3 might be on the, uh, on the uh, agenda. So f6, knight g4, f7 check, king h8, queen f4, knight e3. So it's very complicated, and I'll just very quickly go through a line that I worked up here that ends in a, in a draw. So rook f2, knight f5, takes takes, rook e1, rook f7. Black's up a pawn, but here white certainly has, I mean, it's just obvious that white has good compensation. Black could play e5, and this forces white to give up more material, but again, the compensation is sufficient. Black um, has some real problems with his dark squares, and that's enough to give white uh, equality. So check, bishop comes back and now prepares to go to e5. And there's the uh, the draw by perpetual coming. Okay, so bishop to g7 is playable, but it's playable for both sides. The best move, I think, is e takes f5. It gives up this pawn, and it lets the white light square bishop back into play. But on the other hand, the black king side is now very, very safe. And it also lets the black bishop on b7 into the game, too. So both sides got something out of this. King g7, knight e2, knight e5, takes and takes. And here, I would prefer to have uh, have black. 
Um, knight takes d4, by the way, is no good because of knight to g4, while queen takes d4 is even worse on account of knight f3 check. Meanwhile, pretty much in any case except for against h3, black is going to play knight to g4. Also, the pawn on c2 could be a liability, so I like black a little bit more here. All right, well, let's turn to what happened in the game, and this was not good for black, although it was a logical move. He played bishop to h4, pinning the knight and preparing rook takes f5. But here, uh, Ross plays very, very well. Bishop to h6, rook f5, queen e2. Okay, so now the rook is threatened, and queen takes e6 check is threatened. And if that pawn goes, then the bishop on b3 comes into the act, and black is in serious danger. In fact, black has only one move, I think, to, to stay alive. And he's worse after this, too, but it's still a game. Knight to e7. So now knight takes f5, knight f5, bishop f4. And black is still kicking. And if he can keep that pawn mass in the center alive, then he'll have decent chances. But if um, if it can break, if it breaks, then everything will fall apart. I mean, black will just get destroyed. Anyway, that's what black had, had to try. In the game, he played rook takes f1, which just loses. Rook f1. And what now? Um, if rook to e8, I mean, this is kind of the basic point, then queen takes e6 check. Rook takes, rook f8 mate. If you play e5, another way of defending the e6 pawn and the, and the uh, well, the pawn and the square, then queen f3, threatening mate in two. Queen f7 and queen g7, but also mate in two this way. So e5 is no good. In the game, black tried knight to e7, and that also defends the e pawn and prepares knight f5 as a way of blocking the f file, but queen e5. And there's no good defense to the threat of queen and g7 mate. I mean, you can play knight f5, but white just takes it. Game over. So black resigned here. Again, very well done by white. Uh, black had the one chance, I think, after this pawn sack with f5, with e takes f5. If he had done that, he would have stood well. Missing that one chance, he got killed. Okay, so that was a lot of games and, and questions, and um, hopefully I answered them um, to your satisfaction. Anyway, I will... You know, we probably won't do another one of these shows for about another month or so, but um, I try to do them every every so often as uh, enough questions and games um, are put in the thread. So remember, you can always ask them. There's a thread on the training videos from the Masters page. It's on the, the top half of that, and you'll see there are two different threads, one for games, one for questions that are more specific, and, um, you know, you're welcome to uh, to submit submit there. Okay, um, finally, I don't usually mention it, but I, I should every once in a while. should let you guys know two things. So first of all, I have a blog. It's um, thechessmind.net, thechessmind.net. Secondly, I give lessons. So um, those who are interested in that, um, by all means, contact me either through, um, through the mail service on here or through the contact link on my blog. Either one will work. Okay, thanks a lot. See you next time. Bye-bye.